Hello, everybody. Welcome to the 27th episode of Beyond Talking Points. Today we have a special treat for you guys. Um, We are going to... We're not really talking about a political topic today. We... um, I found a video by the YouTuber um, Emperor Lemon uh, titled, YouTube Has Been on a Downward Spiral. Um... That was published August 16th, 2017, so that's a little old, but um, I found it very inter- a very interesting video because it kind of, uh, it, the guy has a very um, unique way of speaking, but he, he, um, he's also kind of trying to go over um, what he, how he thinks uh, YouTube has progressed and um, how he thinks you know, YouTube um, had so much potential and now it's not fulfilling its potential. Um, and so we'll definitely get into um, the maybe what we liked or disliked about that video in particular, but we're just going to try to have a general discussion about our, our thoughts um, on YouTube as a platform, and then we'll probably branch out and compare it uh, and also just think about media in general. Um, so I guess I just want to start by talking about how... Um, how unique YouTube is um, compared to a lot of other media. So, YouTube was created uh, with the intention of allowing average people, average Joes, to um, to broadcast themselves to the world. Um, you, you didn't need a TV studio. You didn't need um, a, a backing from any um, wealthy executives. Um, you really, you didn't even need um, uh, censorship as such. Um, you could pretty much do whatever you wanted to do. Um, you know, whether you like to play instruments or create animations, or uh, if you just like play vi- to play video games, or um, you know, if you or if you're a commentary channel of sorts, whether you're commenting on movies or politics or what have you. Um, and as I was telling my friend here, I, I spend a lot of time <laughs> watching uh, YouTube videos. Um, so I, I would say I'm pretty invested in YouTube as a platform, um, and I'm invested in what YouTube stands for. Um, I, I think the, the idea, ag- again, um, that I was alluding to, the, the idea that you don't... Um, you don't have to be a, a, a big fancy person or you don't have to have a lot of connections um, to put your vo- to, to put your voice out there and to make unique and interesting and engaging content um, is is remarkable um, now some of that has to do with just the the internet in general which maybe we'll even touch on that as well um, but but I do think YouTube uh, occupies a special place um, on the internet itself. Um, And YouTube has definitely changed since it was um, first set up, I think, in 2005. Um, And I guess I'll I'll also just add that I was born in, in 99, so I was not really watching YouTube regularly until I was, you know, 13 or so. Um, so that they're, they're, in some sense, I'm, I'm a bit late to YouTube, um, but I don't think that means that I don't have a lot to say uh, on the matter. Um, so I'll pass it over to my co-host now and we'll go from there. So the, the video we ended up watching, that was all about YouTube and how it's changed over time. He almost, in a way, has it set up in a few different acts. He kind of goes through the stages of YouTube historically, and then he pretty much he, he pretty much explains what he sees and perceives as a breakdown of sorts and how it's turned into something that he no longer likes and so forth. Um, so what, what I think is kind of interesting is he really hones in on the beginning of YouTube, where you have like very specific, usually short videos made by amateur people who are able to essentially go viral before that was the term for it because YouTube was so accessible and then people who put out content that was entertaining to a lot of people or funny to a lot of people, um, it was able to still get wide appeal if it blew up. And um, 
I and, and now that that's not really the case as much because the viral videos you see are um, it, it, it's it's not the same I guess it's not the same quality the, the reason why things could go viral and YouTube as a whole in terms of the content type has changed a lot and the way that I see this in a very general way is it's kind of the way a subculture has become corporatized right and the way that as YouTube grew it set up different kinds of incentives for different kinds of people and then business models adapted to YouTube as a tool and now it is where it is today and that has entailed a ton of changes in terms of the kind of content that is on the platform now as I was watching the video I found that really interesting because he's kind of dancing around that when he gives certain parts of his analysis but it isn't the core of his analysis and that's kind of where I thought this YouTuber went wrong when he was discussing the issue or maybe why he was kind of unfair to certain parties that are involved. But I almost think that this is kind of like a case study of a natural example of something that started as a niche subculture that because because in the beginning of YouTube, it was funny cat videos, funny home videos, people swearing and then just like an animated type videos that were um, entertaining in their own right. Um, but it has changed drastically since then. Uh, so, do, do you want to bounce off that a little bit? Um, I, I guess I'd like to start by um, maybe sharing where I think, where I agree with you, <clears throat> excuse me, where I agree with you and where I think the YouTuber went wrong. Um, so, Emperor Lemon was basically, um, he, he was making an argument that a lot of the faults of YouTube or a lot of the things that we don't like about YouTube have to do um, w w uh, in large part at least with um, the audience um, itself. Uh, that's not a entirely his story. Obviously he includes other, uh, he, he, he uh, blames um, you know the uh, YouTube establishment and, and YouTube as a business. Um, but he's also, he talks a lot about um, you know uh, how people are zombies. Um, how uh, all they want to do is be be doped up on um, easy content that doesn't challenge them, um, and and that uh, isn't truly in good taste. Um, but it's just what they like because they're not very smart. Um, and I, I just think that's a bear. That's that, that's an unfair um, characterization. I mean, and and I'm not even sure that's very helpful in, when we're talking about um, the state of YouTube. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm never quite sure when people are drawing this hard line between a, a high culture and low culture. Um, so I say, um, you know, that I watch a lot of YouTube. Um, and there are some YouTubers that I watch that I would say that their, their content is very high quality and um, it, it engages me and I learn a lot from it. Um, but there's also, there are also YouTubers I watch that, you know, it, it's just for the laughs or it's just like, you know, it's so bad that it's good. Um, you know, and the same is true for television. The same is true for movies. The same is true for, uh, books and literature. Um, the same is true for music. You know, you, you can't, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is I, I'm just not sure I agree with this, um, with, with characterizing a lot of people as just in poor taste, um, I think I, I, I think that um, we're all we all kind of um, go back and forth between good taste and bad taste, and and that's okay, and there's really nothing wrong with that. But I think you wanted to chime in here quickly. Yeah. So I have I have two big thoughts on this. Um, so one of the big thoughts is about I guess the the tone towards content being poor and how he seems to think about those people. And the second one is kind of an economic evaluation of the situation based on incentives. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna talk about the first one and I'll give you a chance to respond so we can close that loop. And then maybe we, I can address that because I think it's interesting. Um, okay, so the first thing is um, I was really off put by the YouTube maker's tone. But with that being said, I understood that's clearly his gimmick given the fact that his, uh, that you know, the, the thing, the avatar that was acting as him in the video was a riff on CM Punk's pipe bomb promo. And I don't know how how literate you are in professional wrestling, but I, I actually was a fan at some point in my life. So I very much remember that. So to some extent he is supposed to be snarky and talking down to us. But that said, 
Um, this is one of the things, and I, I hope this doesn't trigger you that I, I'm saying this throwaway line, but, 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 but one of the annoying parts about educated liberals is that they typically look down and kind of sneer at people with like lower tastes. So they'll like kind of sneer at like how a lot of people sneer at Donald Trump supporters for being like low class. And that, that was the vibe I got because it's like, oh, how dare all of you pathetic consumers watch this bad content. You're proliferating bad content by watching it and subscribing to it. And you're eating up the garbage they throw at you when all it is is a, a let's play video where they follow the same formula all the time, right? But, but to some extent, people should be allowed to enjoy the entertainment uh, and entertainment products they like. I mean, we, we discussed uh, certain kinds of movies and TV shows uh, a while ago. And I'm a, I watch a ton of movies, don't get me wrong. And my very favorite movies in general are like higher end, like people who like movies for the art of it will like them more. But I also love like really commercially made stupid movies sometimes. And I don't like sneer at people for going out and seeing Marvel movies and proliferating Mar Mar Marvel, even if I think Disney is just putting out corporate uh, produced goo. I don't have to like that goo, but it's fine that other people can. I don't have a problem with that. And I, I, I think the real situation here is he's noticing that YouTube is more of this corporatized formulaic goo. But instead of uh, just finding the stuff that he likes and sticking to it, he's really upset that other people like that and, and that he doesn't. So in general, I, I don't think he's necessarily wrong to say people have like, quote unquote, low tastes, right? You have high tastes and low tastes. You have like you have like very trashy pop music but it's okay to like trashy pop music and you have like orchestras which i will never listen to and that's like high art like that that's fine but 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 to sneer at people for saying i can't believe low low entertainment and forms of streaming and youtube videos exist i can't stand for this i wish we had the old days when everybody was producing high-end stuff it's like well you know what the onus is on you to find the high-end stuff and if people don't like it you should let them you should let them watch their trash right and that and that, that's even accepting the presumption that that stuff is trash, right? Um, so yeah. In many ways, um, Emperor Lemon's tone and style of speaking is is just very um, uh, YouTube esque. Um, it, it, it to so you know to be the person who's like you know wagging the finger and being like all you sheeple are just you know, uh, uh, you, all you sheeple are just consuming uh, garbage. Um, shame on you. You know, you should be more like me. I am a, a, a great, cultured, intelligent person um, who knows what true art is. Um, so, you, you know, you just need to, to get in line and, and get, your, uh, get your priorities in order. Um, but, you know, I, I guess I'll just say again, um, I, I do think... As you said, um, that there's nothing wrong with um, liking trashy pop music or, or liking um, gimmicky, um, strange movies. You know, um, it is it is okay to have certain tastes, and it's even okay to engage in you know quote unquote bad taste or low taste. Um, that's totally the the choice of the individual. Um, and so my, my issues with YouTube are, um, they don't really have to do with, with um, the argument that, oh, most YouTube videos are just made in, in poor taste or they're not true, um, or, or, or that most YouTubers don't truly know um, how to create uh, good art. Um, my criticisms of YouTube are, um, are very different than that. Um, but I'll, I'll let you jump in here with your economic analysis and um, we'll see where the conversation goes um, from there. Okay. Uh, so the, the, the point on economics that I wanted to make is I think that the situation that YouTube at, is at is inevitable for like several reasons. So I'm probably going to drop a ton of stuff on you, Matt. And I know I didn't like prime you to expect this kind of rant. So like, I, I don't expect you to like, you know, I don't know, have deep analysis on what I'm saying. But, but these were a lot of my intuitions when I was hearing it. So the whole premise of YouTube is there's not really any kind of gatekeeper. Um, and to, to some extent, if you get a following, you could profit in some way. So what happened is people were quick to find out how you could profit off YouTube, which um, I think the, the, the YouTuber in the video we watched specifically points out that hitting the 10 minute mark means there's going to be an extra ad in your video. So then people are, you know, incentivized to make videos that are 10 minutes or longer because you make more money off views for those videos. So that means a lot of content and spaces that where the videos are going to be shorter than 10 minutes you're not going to make them if you're trying to maximize your profit, 
which means there are certain types of YouTube videos that you're going to be more inclined to make as a creator as opposed to others. So animation, where you could spend a month making a two-minute video, is going to be less popular while to, to, for, for, for creators in terms of a profit opportunity than us two talking on a stream and recording it for an hour and 15 minutes. And the video is made in as long as it takes for us to do this and maybe edit out any technical uh, difficulties. That's very easy to produce much more content that would have much more ad breaks. So that, that's how you end up with a proliferation of um, things like let, let's play videos, where it's just a dude talking over a three hour stream and he's not doing anything particularly exciting except reacting to a video game he's playing for three hours. That takes him pretty much three hours to make. Um, so well, when there's no gatekeepers and you set up these incentives to do a certain thing and you know that some people enjoy Let's Plays, well, you're going to do that over making an animation video, especially if you blow up. Um, the other thing I was going to say, just talking about how corporatized YouTube is and how there's all those CNN videos and every media company that's an actual business is posting on YouTube. YouTube sets up a lot of really interesting business models because you can put essentially any of your material on YouTube for free. So a lot of people think of TV programming as something that um, you, you pay for cable and watch it. It's some sort of premium product. But it is actually really valuable for a lot of businesses and a lot of industries to put out free materials because it's, it either is a testament to their quality because they have all this information in a library, right? So imagine a financial services company like a bank, say they do a weekly podcast, which, which is a thing, right? You see like Morgan Stanley has a podcast and it's just so they can have an hour of content every week that sounds really smart. And then if you see that Morgan Stanley has this huge backlog of public information, you think, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. They put all this out there. I, it, it just looks very professional. So you have all these corporations that are like, well, why don't I post clips on YouTube, right? It's, it's simple. Then people can find more of our information easier. It's free to us. And we could even make some small amount of revenue off it. So that starts, cr that starts crowding out all the small YouTubers because now YouTube is also populated with all this corporate stuff. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, well, I, I, I guess you might want to bring it up later. I wasn't sure if you're heading in the direction to talk about YouTube's profitability for individual users. Um, I'm not sure how much you wanted to talk about that in general. Um, but one problem I had with the YouTuber we watched is he pretty much said it's impossible now. But the problem is people put all their eggs in YouTube instead of spreading out amongst different resources and really owning themselves as a brand. They really just doubled down on their YouTube channel mattering. So when YouTube changed their algorithms, it screwed up people. But then there are a big pot. Well, actually, I would say in the libertarian world, world, I mentioned Tom Woods several times to you, but he's actually very, you know, small in terms of like how many people would you know that know who Tom Woods is, right? He has a large podcast base to some extent, but he's nothing compared to, say, Joe Rogan. But what he does is he's very tactical about putting out a ton of free information. And then if you find him and like him, then he eventually gets you to pay for other stuff. That, that That's an expansion beyond free. So YouTube is great for people who want to have a bunch of free material, um, even though, and then they make their money outside of YouTube. That's Tom Wood's whole thing. I'm sure he's not getting much money from YouTube, but he is a very self, he is a very profitable one, one man business. And it's because, and he uses YouTube as a tool, right? So that, that's also how businesses have adapted to YouTube existing. Um, so yeah, that, that, that was just a lot of stuff that came to my mind, but I also like, I don't know, I went to business school for three years and I'm an economics major. So I was just like, huh, maybe it's not as simple as YouTubers can't make money now. Maybe, 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 maybe it's more complex, like the people who can use YouTube as a business tool has changed dramatically once people saw what kind of resource it was. Um, so that's my tangent. I don't know if that triggers any thoughts in your mind um, or if you wanna, if you wanna move on in the, on the topic. I think I'll try to tie um, the profitability back in a little later into the conversation. I'll, I'll write it down so I don't forget. Um, but I guess I have one more like little criticism of this YouTuber, then I guess I'll, I'll give a little bit of where I think he's right or um, my criticisms of YouTube in general. Um, so another mild criticism. To, you know, back when YouTube uh, first started or within the first, you know, five years or or so of, of or 10 years of YouTube um, it was far less known um, there were far fewer users um, there was far fewer uh, uh, creators and 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 um, there was far much much less content um, 
but when it became expanded and, and now pretty much everybody um, with an internet connection knows um, what YouTube is, and probably even if you don't have an internet connection, you know what YouTube is. Um, so that's going to lead to more people trying to capitalize on YouTube, and um, that might lead to more content out there that, that uh, people like um, Emperor Lemon just don't like, just because there's far more <laughs> content out there, far more people trying to become YouTubers, um, you know, part-time or full-time. Um, so, and the same you could say is true for television, you know, back in the day there were like three channels, and now there's, what, hundreds of thousands of channels? Um, so, you know, there's going to be, uh, you know, I, there, there's ups and upsides and downsides to that. You, you could say the upside is, well, there's more channels, there might be more good things out there, um, for, or, or there might be more likely that you would find something that you like, but there's also a higher likelihood that you'll find stuff that you don't like. Um, and I guess my one of my huge criticisms of YouTube is the uh, so, so you mentioned how um, YouTube was um, there, there wasn't a lot oh, I don't remember the exact word you used but um, there wasn't gatekeeping that's what you said there isn't there wasn't a lot of gatekeeping in YouTube um, but it seems to me that the, uh, gatekeeping is slowly becoming um, something that is a part of YouTube. Um, not, not exactly the same as in the gatekeeping of, of, of a television show, um, but there is becoming more gatekeeping, you know. Um, there have been like a couple uh, ad apocalypses, um, you know, uh, some, some advertisers left YouTube because, uh, was it the Wall Street Journal said that PewDiePie was a Nazi? Um, I think Steven Crowder was temporarily demonetized um, th there's a lot of effort on the part of YouTube to, um, try to, I guess, conform to, um, the times and, and try to appear a advertiser, um, friendly. Um, and now that they're, yeah, they're a business, so, I mean, technically they have the right to do whatever they want. Um, they can kick off anybody they want to I at the end of the day, um, and, and, you know, people technically can't say, well, you're limiting my free speech because uh, that's a bit different than um, b b because it's, it is a private owned company. Uh, it's a platform that you don't have to be on. That's a bit different than, say, the government throwing you in jail because you're um, criticizing a political candidate. But I do think that um, the fact that, that YouTube is um, putting up gates um, I, I think that will lead to and is leading to a decrease in the quality of YouTube um, because as I said, what I do like about YouTube um, or what I think is its most groundbreaking achievement is the fact that there wasn't much gatekeeping. I mean, I don't know about now, but I, there was a time when you could literally find ISIS videos <laughs> on YouTube. Now that's an extreme example. Um, you know, and I'm not even, I'm not saying necessarily that, that you should find ISIS videos on YouTube, but, but I'm, I'm just saying that, um, e there is so much content on YouTube and, and I, I, I want there to be a lot of content. I want there to be a, a wide range of views or, or, or a wide range of opinions on YouTube. Um, I want, you know, I want various genres on YouTube. Um, th that is what makes YouTube, um, so important to me. Um, it, it has in some ways become a, uh, it has replaced television for, for many people our age. Um, and it, 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 uh, it's a shame to me if, if YouTube is going to become, uh, if YouTube is going to start, uh, trying to censor everybody they just don't like, um, just because they're afraid that, um, ad revenue is being pulled away. Um, I guess I can also... Uh, kind of tie in the profitability aspect, and then I'll let you respond. Um, I'm not that I, I'm not that concerned with profitability on YouTube. Um, you know, if, if you there's nothing wrong with making money on YouTube, and um, some people do, some people succeed, some people don't succeed, some people have a moderate amount of success, but perhaps not enough to live on. Um, 
but I, as a viewer, I suppose, and, and as someone who does um, create uh, YouTube videos sometimes, I'm, I'm just more interested in, um, in, in creating and uh, uh, consuming interesting content. Um, that, that's really my, my main um, concern around YouTube. It, it's, it's less about, um, you know, am I going to become the next PewDiePie or um, it, it, it's less about, um, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't even think I've ever donated any money to any YouTubers that I, that I even really like. Um, it, it's just a matter of, you know, being entertained and educated and, and just a matter of finding, um, content that is enjoyable and interesting for me to watch. Um, and, and so, yeah, that, that's really at the end of the day, that, that's my, um, concern about YouTube it, it, over, um, profitability as such. Yeah, I, I think all that is all that's very interesting because you have the whole situation where like the ad apocalypse happens, and if you put yourself in YouTube shoes, where a whole stink has happened because of something kind of dumb, and then a bunch of advertisers get riled up by activists, then to some extent, assuming even assuming the best intentions on YouTube's part. They might feel obligated to do, to do, to do something, and that's going to lead to them either demonetizing certain things or pulling advertisements from all kinds of a certain type of content. So, like, pretty much anything that talks about, like, the coronavirus can get demonetized, right? Um, I've heard that a lot, and that's why, like, a lot of YouTubers will, like, joke about not saying the word coronavirus or COVID-19. Um, so, you see a lot of that come into play. And ideally, that wouldn't be a concern, right? In, in a perfect world, you'd say, well, it's great that people can make videos and talk about whatever they want. We shouldn't have to worry about that. But I don't see an immediate work around it as long as advertising is the basis of YouTube as a corporation's revenue, right? So I think that's kind of inevitable with YouTube. Now, on the sides of the creators, though, that's going to lead to like essentially one of two things. It either leads to now that you're demonetized and you're making money on YouTube, you stop making videos and you go get a different kind of job because YouTube has screwed you. Or you do the thing that, um, you know, as, as we both know, he's your favorite podcaster, Dave Rubin. Dave Rubin goes and he creates Locals.com. And on that, he's essentially redoing what Patreon's doing, but saying he won't ban creators. And then pretty much saying, yeah, I know YouTube's going to demonetize me. You all know YouTube's demonetizing, like it's going to demonetize Dave Rubin's videos. So it's like, if you give me five bucks, I'll give you a bunch of bonuses and you can talk to other fans of the show and I'll chime in and then I'll still post my interviews on YouTube, but I'll have more, a little more stuff here if you actually give me money. And that's the way he works around, you know, the advertisement revenue loss. So you're going to either have to see people making money off platform. So you could see like huge YouTubers then self-publishing more books, right? You can see guys who are arguing or giving political lectures or on podcasts. That's why all of them release books is because podcasting isn't a great money maker. But you know what it is, is writing a book. And then a bunch of people who like your podcast go, yeah, I'll read 225 pages about this, about what this guy has to say about, you know, whatever relevant topic. And then he gets the revenue from that. So you're either going to see, yeah, like, 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 like people like animators who it might be harder for them to make money in a, on a, off the side are getting kind of screwed, which is where, you know, the, the video we watched is pretty accurate. If people were making their money off like 5 million hits from a YouTube video uh, every two months, then they could, then they could do it. But if that revenue has gone down significantly and they have the potential of being demonetized and that's their whole revenue base, then those people can get screwed and then you lose that type of content. Um, so yeah, I so so that, that's where I think that truly kind of comes into play. Um, now, a, as a person who uses YouTube, I'm not usually using it for that kind of stuff. So it's it's not usually at the forefront of my mind. Um, and a lot of stuff that I do watch on YouTube is either stuff you link me, or to some extent, it is very corporatized and in line with what YouTube is okay with. Because I listen to a lot of podcasts off of YouTube. But as I'm listening to something, if I have nothing to do, sometimes I'll watch people who are really good at video games playing video games. And like they're doing exactly what YouTube wants them to be doing. It's like very tame and they're just really good at a video game. And it's pretty compelling. And that's kind of the stuff that uh, is being incentivized right now because it's very neutral. It's just content that people will watch like a 20 minute video of a guy playing a video game because he's skilled at it. Um, so I, I think that's how it, it interfaces there. And I can see how that's clearly being incentivized by the algorithm because it's completely uncontroversial in just about every way, right? And I can see how YouTube continues to promote promote uncontroversial things. Um, 
But it is interesting because just because the internet's opened up so many things, um, we, we talked about how YouTube was kind of a conglomeration of subcultures, but it's almost like the amount of subcultures has expanded. It's just outweighed by the fact that there's so much generic content, right? Because there are more niches than ever. You, you, you can find an audience in pretty much anything now. Um, and and I, I don't think we, we should overlook that because you, you can you can make like the most specific things and there's a group of people pretty much out there for almost any topic you can imagine. And um, that, that that's one of like the most empowering things about the internet in my opinion is if you can find like the thousand people that love the same thing you love and would buy your stuff if you're really good at it, then you can kind of do whatever you want as long as you can harness it. Um, so I just wanted to note that. So um, I think, uh, uh, you know, again, just to be clear, I'm not, um, YouTube is in the authority to basically do whatever it wants. Um, if it wants to one day get, you know, if the people who work at YouTube or the head of YouTube, they want to get up and say, okay, we're only allowing Let's Plays and cat videos and, you know, uh, makeup tutorials. And if you're, if, if you're anything out above the these, you know, really special, um, um, tame uh, genres, then, you know, uh, go take a hike. We don't want you. Um, they could do that. Um, there's nothing stopping them, um, but but I think that I, I think that is a poor um, business decision from the perspective of um, the viewers and from the perspective of the creators. So you know there must be a middle ground. There has to be some balance. It's not all just about, or it shouldn't be all just about um, money making. You know, I, and I think. I think we we can have um, uh, creators and, and who are attempting to you know push the boundaries and are attempting to reinstate uh, a certain amount of um, freedom on the platform. I mean, just to take a, an example from television, uh, I would say a TV show such as South Park is really pushing the boundaries of what is acceptable on television, um, and for all intents and purposes, they have been successful. I mean, they're still on. Most people, generally speaking, say it's still pretty well written. Um, so, you know, I, I'm really looking, or I want. I think more people should be attempting to push the boundaries in, in these various mediums, um, and that 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 includes YouTube. So, you know, a lot of the YouTubers that I watch, um, they're they're not necessarily the most palatable. Um, that they're not uh, creating content that is um, uh, that is pandering to the, um, the the largest possible demographic. Um, you know, I I watch videos of Laura Southern, <laughs> uh, an alt light, I guess you would say, uh, uh, journalist. Um, I, I watch uh, Jordan Peterson lectures. Um, I watch uh, The Hill, which, which is, I mean, that's uh, that's a news um, uh, a news channel. Um, I uh, I watch. Well, I mean, I, I and when I was younger, um, when I was like a teenager, I used to watch all kinds of strange things. I used to watch Leafy is here. No one, <laughs> no one remembers who Leafy is here was. Um, but uh, you know, he was this commentary uh, channel who was you know making fun of everybody he could. Kind of, kind of similar to, to PewDiePie in a way. Um, so you know, I I th th there should be I I, uh, I watch I like uh, some of Idub's content. He's very controversial and very raunchy. Um, so I I am specifically looking for the content creators which are willing to take risks, who are willing to take risks, who are willing to push boundaries. Um, I, I'm specifically looking for the content creators who are trying to um, retain the the sort of freedom that. YouTube um, once had, and if it comes to a point where, um, again, it, it, it is y YouTube just starts shutting down anything that is um, moderately controversial, and we haven't quite gotten there yet, and, and probably we won't, but you know, you never know what happens with these companies. Um, 
I would be far less inclined to um, to spend so much time um, on YouTube, and I would hope that you know someone else might be able to create um, another platform which would um, r retain more um, freedom and, and and retain the primacy of content creators. Now, I think there have been some. Uh, some attempts to, to do this uh, exact thing. Um, none of them have really gotten the traction of YouTube, um, and a lot of them often tend to be, um, you know, right conservative or, or far right people because um, they, they often have a lot, a lot of views or, or say a lot of things which are considered unpalatable um, to uh, uh, corporations these days. Um, so, yeah. So, part, 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 part of, uh, okay, an important part of that realm of the discussion is the idea of network effects. And, you know, the, the idea of a network effect is pretty simple. Um, imagine you invented a telephone, but guess what? It's no good because only you have a telephone. You need at least two people to have a telephone for the telephone to have any value. And once everybody has a telephone, then a telephone has a ton of value because you can contact anybody. So that's kind of what's happened with YouTube is YouTube has benefited from a lot of network effects where everybody's on YouTube and everything ends up on YouTube. So why would you go anywhere but YouTube? Um, you can see something similar when you look at Twitter versus like Parler. It's like, well, you could go on Parler because they're more pro free speech, but Parler doesn't have the network effects because a ton of people just aren't on Parler because it's not big enough to warrant their time. Um, so, th so, so I think network effects play a large role. And really, I, I don't think YouTube um, at, at this point is anything very impressive. It's a large scale video hosting website that has benefited from network effects. And it was, it's the person who is dominating that you know, segment of the industry. The only difference between YouTube and Dailymotion is Dailymotion doesn't have enough users to hit that critical mass to where people just start going to Dailymotion instead. Um, so, I, I just want to mention that, and that, that's the main reason why I don't expect something to usurp YouTube despite YouTube's problems. We're kind of at this point because enough people aren't willing to all leave at once, to despite all the controversies around YouTube, that it still benefits from network effects and is kind of inevitably used. Um, now, I think another element in the role of creators versus uh, you know, uh, YouTube as a company is um, the, the, the idea that... YouTube should be the one that's getting you viewers. Okay, so that's something that was kind of touched on in the video. You post something on YouTube and nobody, no, no, there, there isn't a single person who's really gonna stumble upon it. There, there's not gonna be more than a few hundred almost any of the time. It's hard to have grassroots traction now. And th this kind of, um, I, I don't think you're that familiar with the self-publishing world in terms of Amazon. Um, I, I am. For, for some reason, I don't know, I pay attention to that segment of things. It's very fascinating. So part of it is a lot of people who independently write books are really upset because you post a book on Amazon and guess what happens? Not a single thing because you're a nobody and nobody's read your book or reviewed your book. So why would Amazon's algorithms show it to random, to, to random shoppers? It's like, well, we don't know if it's a good recommendation. Nobody's bought it. So you have to really get your own traffic to your own Amazon book for people to buy it. So that's why the people who do Amazon ads for things are usually the people who are selling the product. It's not just Amazon buying random ads. Um, that's kind of where YouTube's at, where if you are not redirecting people towards your content, it's really hard to get views because it's just kind of sitting there in this massive void. So to some extent, the YouTuber we watch was kind of arguing that that's stupid. You used to be able to just find um, other related videos really easily, and it was more simple. But that's not really the case now. So I, I think I would argue that's not really the case in terms of any website. To get traffic anywhere, because the internet itself is just so huge, you really have to get enough people around you and direct them in the correct ways. And you have to hope that you can stand out in a certain aspect to get going. Um, like you have to get people's attention by, like I guess, being really good on Twitter. And then maybe after you do that, you can redirect people to your YouTube or your podcast and so forth. Or you get interviewed on a different channel. And that's how you really get kicked off because somebody noticed you. That, so it's not really that. Um, OK, so I wanted to mention that in the context of boundary pushing content. So imagine there's something that somebody made that was really, really well made, heavily edited. Um, but it was definitely not going to be tasteful for YouTube standards. So the thing is, since if you post things on YouTube already, you're not guaranteed traction, 
you kind of have to be able to mobilize that traction on your own. So wh whether you're directing people towards your YouTube link or your daily motion link or your Vimeo link shouldn't matter that much if you're mobilizing your own contact and not expecting YouTube to show you to people, right? Does that make sense? So I think the way that people are gonna start working around, you know, content that is kind of boundary pushing is they're just gonna find ways to mobilize support while outside of YouTube and then just host it on a different site that is way less popular. But it doesn't really matter because they're not expecting YouTube to serve their video. Um, and I think that's where we're gonna start finding things that are really boundary pushing. And that's kind of the angle Vimeo is trying to, was trying to search for. It was kind of like, well, we know we can't be YouTube, so how about you can host any content here, but we're gonna make it seem like everything is very well produced that's on Vimeo. Um, just because they kind of want people to host their stuff there. And it, it seems like that was an angle they were pushing at one point. Um, so I think that's how I guess the problems you're bringing up are kind of going to be met. And I don't think it's that big of a deal if those boundary pushing videos are no longer on YouTube. It's like if YouTube's at its point in its company life, uh, in its life cycle where it doesn't want that content, then fine. Somebody else will host it and people will find ways to get to it if it's important. That, that's kind of the way I see it playing out. It's just, it's gonna be challenging for the creators and it would be great if YouTube was an ally in that perspective, but I don't think they have the financial incentives in terms of being a huge company. Those advertisement margins really matter. Um, so I don't think the incentives are there for YouTube to you know, re reverse course. And I think people are gonna start looking for ways around it and recognizing what the algorithm does and, and what, what the things they should do given the circumstances. So, um, well, f uh, for the record, because I literally just said on recording that I watch Laura Southern videos, um, <laughs> in case anyone's curious, I'm not uh, a conservative person. I'm not a right wing in any way. And I watch a lot of other kinds of videos as well. I watch, um, uh, you know, YouTubers performing covers. Um, I watch other left wing commentary. Um, I, I, I watch animation. I watch, uh, so I even watch some, you know, people playing video games. Um, so, uh, you know, I, that, uh, w while I wouldn't say my, I watch, you know, a lot of my news um, comes from YouTube as well. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not necessarily the most well-versed in every genre on YouTube, but I would say I, I, I watch a good, a good portion of it. Um, but I, I guess to respond directly to what you were saying, um, I'm not quite ready myself to abandon, um, YouTube, uh, as a platform to, um, uh, both, um, receive information and to, um, to, uh, release information, um, to, to you know, to both, uh, be a, a, a viewer of content and to produce content. Um, th th yeah, I, I mean, you're very, you're very, uh, you're, you're very correct in that there could come a point where um, uh, raunchy or, or um, uh, content that pushes the boundaries just can't be on YouTube anymore. Um, but we really we really haven't gotten there yet. Um, you know, for all for all the problems of YouTube, um, I, I would still say it has some life to it. Um, I would still say that there is some there is still an ability to um, be moderately successful or at least get your voice out there um through youtube you know um uh i did mention steven steven crowder uh, a, a little while ago i mean he did get re-monetized um so he's still on youtube um so i i, I do think that or, or 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 rather i am still interested in reforming youtube um as as much as possible i i just don't think um or i haven't come to the conclusion that it's so god awful that um i you know i don't ever watch want to watch another second of a youtube video um but but i do think that i do think that to a certain extent like the like emperor lemon that that youtube has lost its way um from the way it was intended to be run um, and I, I, I guess I'm a little more optimistic than you, or, or, or at least rather, I, I don't, um, I, I do think that the content creators have a certain amount of sway and, and that they might be able to, um, 
tur turn YouTube uh, back, you know, turn the course of YouTube back around and, and for it to become a bit more um, uh, uh, free and, and a bit more creator friendly um, than it is now. Uh, I could be wrong about that. I hope I'm not, but I could be. Um, but yeah, no, I'm not, I, I'm not going to, <laughs> I'm not going to, you know, quote unquote, abandon YouTube. Um, I'm not going to go out and create my own <laughs> video server anytime soon. Um, cause I, I still think YouTube does have some life in it. And you know, I, there, there's a reason that I watch so much YouTube that there are creators out there on YouTube that I really like. Um, you know, I, either I really agree with them on a lot of, um, sociopolitical issues or they're just entertaining, or I just enjoy hearing their perspective. And I want to hear the perspective of someone who just completely disagrees with me. Um, so, but the same is true. You know, I still watch TV sometimes. Um, I still watch movies. I still listen to music. Um, I don't think these these different uh, styles of media, a lot of them, they don't go away. You know, online video isn't going to go away. Movies aren't going to go away. Television isn't going to go away. Um, you know, you might have to become a bit more um, selective as to what you watch, or, or you might have to sift through more content to find the stuff that you really like. Um, but at the end of the day, there's, there's really nothing wrong with that, um, in my view. Yeah, I, I wasn't trying to imply that people should, like, tomorrow stop using YouTube. And I, and I, I think we, we agree on, I, I guess, accepting YouTube as a functioning site for now to, to some extent. Like, you still use it to watch certain things, and I still use it to watch certain things. And, and, and I'm okay with that. Um, I, I, I guess what I'm saying is I think it's more likely that the creators who have been disenfranchised by YouTube because of YouTube's new algorithms or by certain types of content being banned, I, I, I guess what I'm saying is it's more likely that they'll find unique ways to monetize themselves outside of YouTube before YouTube will start bringing back things that incentivize it. So if animators think, okay, well, as long as I get this amount of money, I can put together the, the, this much content. Then you'll see them you'll see them raising money in other ways. And like in the past, we've seen Kickstarters used and GoFundMe's used for different kind of creative people who there wasn't really a business like like, like YouTube that, that that would serve them, right? And a lot of those are for completely different products. But it, it's really just there's no corporation that could plug into and make money, so they found a different way to get crowdfunded, right? So I think it's more likely than not that people have been screwed over by YouTube setup will find ways outside of YouTube to make a living as opposed to YouTube deciding to re re revert course. Um, I, I don't see them like rolling back their, 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 their lean into corporate media. It's just something they're going to do because they have such a wide reach now and such a general reach. So the generic thing they'll, they'll recommend you is going to be a late night talk show. If they don't have any data on you, it's like, Oh, well, well this is something a lot of people like, so we're going to, we're going to put this in front of you. Um, I think that's kind of inevitable. So I think that's where we disagree. Um, like, like I, I would be happy if they backtracked it. I just don't think the business incentives are there, right? So I, I don't see any reason why a corporate executive would say, yeah, we, we should lean back into these things about YouTube because every time they try, it doesn't really work. I, I, I think you've seen all those really terrible videos where they bring together like a ton of creators to try to do like a big, a big like, uh, um, what, what's it called? a big video that featured like 20 people and they had like a 20 minute video on it and it was terribly cringeworthy and it was like very negatively received by YouTube or like the YouTube community in general. So it seems like when YouTube tries to do things that are fan servicey, they fail. Um, so I don't, I don't know. I, I'm just generally, I wouldn't expect a business to do something that they're not financially motivated to do. That's just the general course of things. But if individuals still want to find a way to keep doing what they were doing and make money, they're going to work outside of YouTube then. They're going to abandon YouTube. And I'm not expecting you to abandon YouTube tomorrow, but then if a critical mass of people leave YouTube, then, you know, you, you might stop going to it as much because maybe they'll only have a certain few creators you like. Um, so that I, 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 I think that's just specifically the thing I wanted to get across. Mm, I mean, I, I guess we we do view it differently in, in this respect. Um, I, I do think, I, I do think that, um, from the perspective of, um, running a, uh, run, running a, um, a business. Um, I, I do think YouTube has, um, 
I think that YouTube has some skin in the game when it comes to um, allowing for diversity of views, allowing for um, a, a, a great a, a, a great uh, amount of, of content creators um, and, and allows for um, content that does pers that does push boundaries and can be um, profane or raunchy or um, or you know just just very basic and 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 mainstream content um, you know because because as I said that was the really the whole point of YouTube's creation um, and it will be more likely um, not necessarily that YouTube will go away but that as you say um, if they become very strict on the kind of content that they are they allow on their website then it, it will um, and there will inevitably be somebody else that comes along that is able to take that kind of content um, and it's po quite possible that they could um, that they could rise to the top and be, be just become a competitor um, so you know it's it's hard to know what it would take for YouTube to com completely roll back um, a lot of the changes that uh, that they implemented. I mean, YouTube uh, has been around for quite a, a while, um, so it has gone through a lot of changes, a lot of permutations. Um, and is it possible that YouTube could become far worse in the future? Yes. Is it possible that YouTube could become better in the future? I, th I think that's also possible. Um, so I, I just don't agree, I guess, with the idea that um, YouTube doesn't have, or that in terms of running a successful business, that, that it shouldn't matter to YouTube executives, or, or they don't need to worry about um, the, uh, the opinions and, and the um, attitudes of, of their content creators. Um, if or, yeah, I think I think that was a correct, a grammatically correct sentence. But you know, it. it uh, so I guess I'll just I'll summarize what I'm trying to say. You know, it is important, I think, from a business perspective, for YouTube to um, c concern itself with what kind of platform it wants to be, and to concern itself with the, um, uh, c to concern itself with what it content it, what, what its content creators um, want and need um, and I I really do hope that it doesn't um, just become um, the next television that was kind of what Emperor Lemon was saying that it's basically now it's just another form of television or, and he was saying basically a crappier form of television because there's less money in it um, but I, I don't I, I don't think that's necessarily going to be the most profitable in the long run for YouTube as a whole. I, I so I, I think I agree with the, the general idea of it, but there there is an element that I think I need to, to just just tie into the the, the thought process there. Um, so kind of what what you seem to be saying is YouTube currently is disenfranchising some people, and it's not really serving all of their uh, stakeholders. So if they're not serving stakeholders in the name of short-term advertising profit, that could be bad for the company overall because they're not serving like uh, the, the the YouTube users, right, and all the creators. Um, so the, I, th I think the the only issue with that line of thinking is um, the idea of conflicting stakeholders, right? So it, it's easier to think of YouTube when it was first started and there was only a certain amount of users. And you could probably be easier to categorize all those people as having similar either tastes or similar expectations from YouTube. But as YouTube became more ubiquitous, I guess, in our day-to-day -day lives, it almost became more of a tool and a medium than necessarily like a company, right? Because you go on and you're like, I want to watch a you know, Young Turks video. You're not thinking, oh, I'm going to just go on YouTube. So some people could think of it that way. So what ends up happening is people see YouTube as a tool to do different things. So once you roll back the things that we see, you and I see, as infringements on certain creators or harming certain types of things being created, other people might say, well, I wanted those kinds of creators gone, right? So there were people who wanted Steven Crowder to be off YouTube because they didn't like Steven Crowder. And demonetizing him is a step in that direction because some people think he's a vile bigot, right? 
So you have conflicting stakeholders, which really mu which muddies the issues because like the advertisers have different interests than the users, and some users hate other users, and some users hate certain types of content, think it's vile. So in the end, there are going to be people who aren't happy, and in the end, people don't really compromise on things together. It's really just some people kind of get left out, and some people don't. Um, now, if YouTube makes the wrong decision and then serves the wrong stakeholders, then it will lead to a faster, you know, downward decline of the company, right? And it'll hit the hit the ground. So I, I guess what, what, when we talk about YouTube turning into TV, which is like declining medium right now, um, you could say that that it, that that's like kind of like a negative view of it. You're assuming that YouTube's on this huge decline and that it's it's continuing down that road. Um, but you, but then we're also assuming that most users of YouTube are unhappy with the things we're complaining about. And there are a lot of really casual users of YouTube that probably don't have an opinion or are okay with a lot of the people being banned that we've heard been banned, right? Like I would prefer if Alex Jones was on YouTube because then if I wanted to have a quick laugh, I could go on YouTube and watch dumb Alex Jones like 20 minute rant, but I can't do that on YouTube. And some people are really happy that I can't do that on YouTube. So because they don't want him hosted there. They don't want anything that implies that there's any agreement or societal acceptance of that view. So it, it really comes down to what stakeholders does YouTube want to serve. And then the, the one thing I want to mention on the television comparison, because I, I did have some thoughts on that, was I was just thinking about how great TV is compared to when there are only three TV channels. Because because one thing that I stupidly enjoy watching is poker. I think poker's amazing to watch. It is so crazy some of the things people do, betting all kinds of money when there are hundreds of thousands of dollars on the line, and you know that guy has dirt, and then he makes a ballsy play, re-raises somebody who has the better hand, and that guy with the better hand has to fold. There are amazing things like that that happen in poker, but poker would not get on TV if TV had a very limited amount of channels. But luckily, you could throw on a channel that is dedicated to poker because there are channels dedicated to almost everything nowadays. So YouTube is just an expansion of that in terms of the diversity of types of content where you have niches significantly smaller than poker have tons of content. So even though it's in a way becoming more corporatized in the way that like cable TV is, is rearing its ugly head on YouTube and being promoted on YouTube, it's still very, very diverse, just like how TV ended up being very, very diverse. Because as you expand to the medium, you can reach so many different niches. So I still think that's pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I'm, I, was, I was just throwing all that out there. Um, so conflicting stakeholders and maybe kind of being like TV in some ways isn't inherently terrible. Um, but that, that's kind of me dumping my thoughts. Um, I'm not sure if you were looking to wrap up, so maybe you can chime in with your, your last few thoughts and maybe we can wrap up the episode. Okay, so um, I suppose there are near the closer near to the close of the episode we we are seeing um where we differ and then where we align um you and i seem to be differing on the um on where we think youtube places um the importance of shareholders um so correct me if i'm wrong but when i what i hear you saying is you take the um, advertisers to be um, the most important thing for YouTube, and so um, the the advertisers at the end of the day will have um, will will have the say as to what is and is not okay on YouTube. And I seem to be saying that I, what wait, is I'm saying something a little different. I, I'm saying that there are several shareholders. Advertisers, one of them, but even when you think of creators and viewers those shareholders in themselves aren't even really just them because some viewers hate other kinds of viewers who watch certain kinds of content, right? And sometimes the viewer stakeholders use the advertisers as a lever to beat the creators they don't like, right? So that's what they did with Steven Crowder. As viewers of YouTube said, we don't like Steven Crowder, demonetize him. We want the advertiser stakeholder to be used as a weapon against this stakeholder group. So you have stakeholders who all have different things, but then there's even in-groups within the stakeholders. So you can't even make like the viewers happy because some viewers have different values than other viewers, right? So I'm saying there are certain things that if you set on any stakeholder, you're going to piss off another stakeholder, right? I guess that's what I'm trying to get at. I don't think there's any one way that would please all the viewers and creators. 
because some creators, like the guy who Steven Crowder ridiculed for his lisp, that guy hates Steven Crowder, and he thinks it's a bad place when other creators can be, you know, uh, very, very loose with their words and ridiculing other people. So it's those ones have a different interest than Steven Crowder does, right? That, that's what I'm getting at. Okay, well, I think... Um, all right, then I guess we definitely disagree because I'm not... I'm certainly not making the claim that YouTube can ever please everybody. Um, that is not... Um, th that is not possible. I would never, I would not make that claim. Um, the claim that I am making, um, though, uh, has to do with, um, allowing, um, a allowing the content creators as much space to do, it, uh, whatever it is that they, um, they want to do. Um, so, yeah, I mean, because yes, I mean, you're right uh, in in that um, not even all content creators like other content creators, and there are some content creators who would say, you know, you should ban this content creator because he made fun of me or because I hate his content. Um, and, and then there are the share there. Are, then there are the advertisers that are you know paying uh, the money to have, um, or or th that are paying. Um, YouTube money to, to run their ads, um, and so they say, well, you know, I don't like this content, or, you know, this content can't be monetized, or if you want my ads on your site, you can't have this content on the website at all. Um, but, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't bother me, and that's not, um, that's not my goal. My goal is to return, as much as possible, is to return YouTube to, um, to empower the creators as much as possible. Um, that might not be possible. Uh, again, it, it might just become another corporate media. Um, but I, I, I would be very disappointed in YouTube if it does go down that road. Um, it has been creeping down that road um, somewhat, but um, th there, there is still uh, th there is still a difference between um, YouTube and uh, television. Um, so this kind of ties into what you. I mentioned there. Um, so, you know, I, I'm not going to sit here and say that, oh, television's bad. Television rots your brain. I hate television. Um, there's nothing wrong with television. I watch television. Um, and, you know, there are, and there, there, as you, and, and I think I mentioned this earlier. I mean, there is uh, a case to be made that, um, you know, the more channels on YouTube or on television, you know, there can be good sides or, or bad sides to that. Um, and, you know, but I can I can turn on the History Channel, and often they have um, interesting documentaries that I can watch, um, or you know I can find movie channels with movies that I've wanted to see but didn't bother going to see them in theaters, um, or I can watch something you know fairly low class like The Big Bang Theory. <laughs> um, but uh, so my 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 point is though that I think they're they're. Um, there, there is a certain level of freedom on YouTube still, or t to a certain extent, e even despite the changes they've made, and even down, even despite some of the errors that they've made, in my opinion, to their business model, there is still a certain amount of freedom um, to the the, uh, the the range of content on YouTube. Now, again, occasionally the TV has um, shows like uh, All in the Family, which really push the boundaries of, of, of what TV is supposed to be, or uh, Married with Children, or you know, there are the, there are, um, there's history of, of television shows that really are just like wow. There's nothing like or Rick and Morty isn't is a quick is another uh, more recent example. It's like these these shows. It's like wow. There's never really been anything like this on TV before. Like, can you really say that on television? Um, so you know, again, I'm not demonizing television, but but I do think that. YouTube allows um, things that television does not, and that's what I like about YouTube. That's why I spend so much time uh, uh, watching content on YouTube, and um, it would be um, it, it would be depressing to me if YouTube loses that completely. Yeah, I, I I think I agree with what I think I agree with what you're saying. I I think the only nuance I was trying to draw was. I agree with your vision. I'm okay with that vision because I'm more in line with you in terms of taste. So I'm not one of the people who wants to see people demonetized. I was just trying to like kind of say, 
but other people would get left out. So it's hard to say that one's obviously like a better business decision for YouTube. That's kind of what I was contesting because I just was looking at the incentives. But I think the vision, I'm in agreement with you. I would enjoy that more than them becoming corporatized. I want to see people able to just post what they want to post. That's what YouTube initially was, and I'm okay with that. I prefer that over you know very stringent rules and very much strictly listening to only advertisers. And I want to see creators be able to be more creative in terms of what the content they put out is. I don't want everything to be the same. Um, so on that note, because I think you did a really good job of wrapping up, um, do you want to say one more word and then some, and then sign us off? Or okay, you can do that. Yeah, I, I just have one more uh, quick like um, kind of mini point to to make on this. Um, I, I don't think um, I, I'm I'm very skeptical that YouTube or or that the um, the managers and the owners of YouTube, the people who work at YouTube, they are trying to be or or. Um, at least from my perspective, they seem to be trying to be the moral compass for the viewer. So they seem to be trying to, um, to, to they, they, they seem in, in the changes that have happened recently. They, they seem to be trying to be saying that, well, we really know um, what you should and should not be watching, um, and that is so. So you know, we are going to strict, uh, you know, create more censorship, demonetize more videos. Um, so we are, are clear that, um, you know, this is okay to say, and this is okay to say, but that is not okay to say, and that is definitely not okay to say, right? Um, so they, and they are concerned, of course, with this concept of, um, hate speech. Um, and, uh, I, I won't get too deeply into that, but I, I'm a bit skeptical. I'm very skeptical of the concept of hate speech. Um, I'm skeptical that YouTube should be in charge of, telling me or you um, or any viewer that um, what they should and should not watch. Um, you know, you brought up Alex Jones. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I would be... Uh, look, I mean, there, there are certain things or, or there are creators out there that are doing outlandish things. They're doing crazy things. They are doing things that maybe they shouldn't be doing. Um, but... Is it really YouTube's responsibility to say um, to that creator or, or even saying to you to the viewer, um, that's not okay, that's immoral, that's that's bad? I, I don't really think that is. Um, you know, uh, do, do I like everything Alex Jones says? Of course not. Is he saying things that are hurtful um, to other people? Um, of course. And, and, you know, that's why people have been taking legal action against him. And that's why, you know, at, at that point people were like, well, we're going to pounce on him. We're kind of, we're kind of going to make an example of him as, uh, in a, in a way. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to add that, um, I, I, I do want a YouTube that is, um, not going to be moralistic. And I, I want a YouTube that is, is close to, to free reign, um, as possible that, that there have to be some, um, limitations. Obviously, everyone has limits. Um, uh, but I, I do want a, a, a um, to um, I, I want a website a, a, a that where the content creators can have a, a unbelievable degree of freedom um, that you really can't have on something such as television. So I think I think I can I can. I, I think I'm confident saying that at Beyond Talking Points, we we hate uh, YouTube paternalism and telling us that we should watch corporatized goo and sludge. I, I think I think that's the real takeaway here. I'm gonna I'm gonna take everything you said that was really valuable and you know about how free speech is important and I'd say, hey, screw you, YouTube! Don't tell me what to watch. I'm gonna watch what I like. Can you stop banning people I like? Thank you. Um, so on that note, I hope you guys enjoyed us talking about the state of YouTube, uh, YouTube's history a little bit, why we think it ended up that way, what are some of the causes, and a little bit of us doing some future projections. Um, feel free to check out the video version on YouTube uh, by searching the anti-philosopher and beyond talking points. Then you can see uh, our facial expressions and my uh, very poor beard here um, as, we as we riff about uh, these topics. Um, and you can obviously find all of our past episodes. Uh, you can also listen to us on any podcast here like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and so forth, um, if you just want to hear us uh, talking. Um, so everybody, thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed. And signing off, it's Matt and Matt.